might say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Great trial lawyers like Mark Mueller are the fighter pilots and emergency room surgeons of the law. Their passion is to fight for truth and justice. Mark successfully seeks relief and vindication for shattered wives and seemingly lost souls. His compassion, warmth, love, and determination of the human spirit is neither imagined nor contrived. His purpose is to promote justice and fairness for injured persons, safeguard victims' rights, and exercise the opportunity to help guide the hands of justice, especially when people's lives have been destroyed, families ruined, dreams lost, or widespread societal change and reform are needed. Dr. Martin Luther King once said about leaders like Mark, the true measure of any man is not how they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but how they stand in moments of challenge and controversy. Mark is the living embodiment of Rudyard Kibling's definition of a man in his poem, If. If you can keep your head when all others are losing theirs and blaming you, the world will be yours and everything in it. What's more, you'll be a man, my son. President Teddy Roosevelt's life shows us that hard work, tenacity, and a desire to do the right thing can get you far in life. This is the central theme of Mark's life as exemplified in the most memorable section of Roosevelt's citizenship in a Republic speech. The man in the arena tells us that the man we should praise is the man who's out there fighting the big battles, even if those battles appear insurmountable. Since founding Mueller Law in 1992, Mark's been known for his unconventional style, as well as his optimism, focus, and imaginative approach to problems and solutions, so he could take on the cases no one else would. His main focus is on finding creative ways to reduce injustice and raise public consciousness. His firm has successfully won medical malpractice liability cases, whistleblower cases involving Medicare and Medicaid fraud, and consumer class actions involving defective software and excessive fees by management companies. The reason that clients come to his firm is because they are guided by the principles of what's right and wrong. A brilliant courtroom tactician, Mark is renowned for his uncanny skill at handling juries, an ability proven time and time again. He can captivate juries with speeches of astonishing length, reduce hardened judges to tears. He's achieved record multi-million dollar settlements and verdicts in a number of jurisdictions over the years, totaling nearly $400 million. He has handled unusual cases such as the so-called condom rape case, where his efforts led to the reform of the grand jury system by using professional counselors to educate grand jurors about rape trauma and responses. This led to the successful prosecution of his client's rapist and ultimately to a civil suit recovery against the landlord for failure to have properly working sliding glass door latches. Mark has been involved in a wide variety of environmental and progressive groups and causes over the years. He has served as a rape crisis volunteer counselor and volunteer legal counsel for a number of public interest and nonprofit organizations. He has also attended and has taught for several years at the nation's finest program for trial lawyers, the Trial Lawyers College, founded by the nation's best trial lawyer, Jerry Spence of Wyoming. In addition to his legal activities, he has founded and runs Voodoo Cowboy Entertainment in Austin, which produces movies, music, and art, and is located in his compound of historic buildings in Austin, Texas. 
He has two sons, 30-year-old identical twins, Max and Andy, who are writing, recording, performing, and preparing to tour the West Coast with their band, Twin Sages. In this insider-exclusive Network TV special, our news team meets with Mark Mueller and some of his very key people in his life and his businesses to go behind the headlines to learn more about this amazing, real 21st century Renaissance man, Mark Mueller. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Austin, Texas. It is my great pleasure to introduce Mark Mueller to the show. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, Steve. Tell our audience a little bit about your law practice and how you have fought against folks that are trying to restrict the rights of individuals. Well, um, I've been doing civil cases after the first three or four years of my practice, which I did criminal cases. Um, and I got involved in medical malpractice I, uh, for many, many years. And that was what I did. I really enjoyed doing it and helping people and people that were significantly hurt. We have with us today Mark's executive director. So let's bring him on right now. Thank you. Tell our audience your full name, please. Sandip Chakraborty. As the executive director, what do you do here at the law firm? I handle the day-to-day -day operations and uh, I work with Mark directly to develop our strategic planning and to implement those plans. Mark's got a major operation going on here. How do you make it run smoothly? Years of practice. I have uh, I have a, a, an extensive background in administration and I am a shamanic practitioner so I'm much more in tune with the energy of individuals and circumstances and so I use the various tools that I've developed over the years. Okay, and that's also in relation to not only the staff here, but also clients, right? Yes. Okay, because clients, as you well know, Mark, they wanna know what's going on with their case at all times. And unfortunately, a lot of people are in distressed situations. You know, they don't have any money, they're out of work, they've been injured, whatever. How do you calm them down? A lot of it is just um, having people get a safe space to be listened to holding space for them to share what the things that they've been holding on to. A lot of our clients have experienced some type of trauma. Sandip's worked for you, is it 13 years? No, I've known him for 15 years. Um, he's worked for me for two or three years. Okay, fine. And how does he and what he does for this firm add value to your firm? He helps make things run smoothly. Um, I have the energy around here Lawyers, a lot of lawyers' energy is is up and down, fast paced, very abrupt, very stressful, and it can be very hard on people, hard on us, the lawyers, hard on the staff, hard on everybody. Um, and Sandip has really helped control the um, the staff, people's attitude, their um, understanding of what's going on. The, he's helped with the continuity and the retaining of people, makes people feel um, more listened to, more accepted at work, um, and he's, he's in general stabilized things quite a bit, which lets me get more work done. Um, I've always got a lot of ideas, a lot of things to, to work with, but the task at hand that I was having trouble with is making sure we had the right people to keep on moving down the road in, in a consistent way. That must be very comforting to know that you have somebody, because obviously everybody respects you here at the firm, uh, knows that things can get accomplished, right? He's, uh, he's kind of what some people might call the velvet hammer, you know, just smooth and calm and makes people feel supported. And they do better work because of it. So it makes it a lot easier for us. You uh, bring that to this firm from your shamanic, is it, am I saying it right, shamanic training, your philosophy? Yeah, and a lot of experience just working with people and administrating as far as there's these phrases like emotional intelligence and things that we need to be aware of. Like I've personalized my team over the years. We did go through a culture shift here when I came on board and we've turned over the staff over the past couple of years. 
And we've made a point not to be in a hurry to hire, but to make sure we have the right fit from the beginning. Smart. And so now we're starting to, to roll and see the fruits of some of that labor over the past couple of years. Good. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us on the show. We're going to have one of your other uh, essential people on the show, Denise Castro. So let's bring her on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Denise Castro to the show. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I understand you're an executive here at Mueller Law. What do you do here? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, there's, there's certain projects or certain special assignments that sometimes I help with. I'm more of a behind the scenes, maybe advisor consultant to Mark. And it, it just depends on what's going on. Every day is different at Mueller Law. I don't think any day is ever the same. You're involved with an organization called uh, Rainbow City? Yes. What is that? And you're the founder of that, aren't you? Uh, Rainbow City is a startup fashion um, company that is going to headquarters is here in Austin, Texas. And um, it, what it is, is it's based on clothing for women but um, geared towards freedom of movement as far as being comfortable wearing um, certain types of clothing that you also feel very comfortable dancing in as well. So when you say startup, you ha are you a designer too? I certainly am doing my best to just, right. yeah. <laughs> um, I, um, I have a little bit of background when it comes to fashion in the sense that I grew up in a household where my mom was a seamstress uh, for over 25 years and, so, and my grandmother was also a seamstress. So um, from a very young age I learned a lot about fabrics and different types of styles and I knew how to like hand bead on like custom wedding dresses and my mom always took me to um, the LA Fashion Textile District and um, from there on, I, I feel as if I always wanted to have my own fashion line because um, I always struggled finding clothing for myself because my body type is sometimes I feel a little bit different as in I can be a little bit taller than the normal average height for a woman, but then I'm also really petite. And I really, really like to dance. And so a lot of, a lot of times when I would find a dress that I'd like to wear, it was very uncomfortable to wear it to go dancing. And even the type of fabric that is used, it looks nice, but it's not really comfortable to actually wear. They don't, um, it's not very breathable fabric. And so that's something that Rainbow City is also uh, focuses on. And that's having more um, organic, breathable type of fabrics which is like hemp and bamboo and organic cotton. How long have you been doing this? Um, I, I would say officially, as far as Rainbow City, um, I would say f over five, seven years. And that's I've been in the design process for an extremely long time, as far as the research and the design goes. And just recently, um, I was lucky enough to be able to be part of um, Mark's annual party and so I was able to put on a, a fashion show uh, for our guests and it was crazy yeah. and I learned a lot and it was a great experience. I saw a lot of photographs on Facebook um, of that party, annual party. How many years have you had this party? About 20. 20 years mm -hmm. and you invite everybody you you invited me. I was well, filming some other. I wish you could have come because you're you're exactly the kind of person that would enjoy being there because it's it's a, it's. A, you know what it reminds me of? Remember the parties that Truman Capote used to go to, you know, in New York, yes. right? Those kinds of where you have a very eclectic group of people, you know, very interesting. People always say, "Who knows all those people?" And the answer is, "I do." <laughs> you know, they all walks of life. Yeah. So, um, also tell our audience a little bit about, you know, you're a lawyer at the, your core, but you have all these other business interests, you know, like Rainbow City. What do you want to see develop from there? Well, I want to support creativity. Yeah. And I, in the lawyer world, I see words all the time. It's written words and paper words all the time and spoken words all the time. And the, I like music. And I like art and I like creativity. And I think that ultimately we were talking before about the um, 
traps of logic, the traps of language, like tort reform, for example. I think that music and art help teach us things quickly, get us into our heart, get us into feeling and motivated to do something. Music is like that. Art, a little bit longer, but still, um, it's, it, it opens something up in you. So I like that creative stuff. Um, and I think it also supports the legal things that we're trying to do. We're all people. You know, if we remember we're people, we'll stop hurting everybody. We'll stop making bad products. We'll stop poisoning the earth. If we just remember that, we'll stop killing each other. That'd be a good thing. So I like lots of things. I like, I, I like having colors. I like having different outfits. I like looking for treasures, you know, in the research. You know, that's finding out what really happened. Um, and uh, I like getting people together and encouraging people to do their own thing. That's what she did. She did her own thing. She had it always had it in her, but just hadn't taken from the paper right. to, the, to, the, to the actual product. Do you have any events scheduled, like fashion show events in the near future here, or what? Um, hopefully Atlanta. It looks like we will have another fashion show coming up in Atlanta. What is it? Um, I believe it's going to be sometime in the, this fall. Because we're going to be in Atlanta. Then you're going to be there, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't, being, yeah, Atlanta, because we have an office in Atlanta. And we're trying, to get, uh, we're trying to get that ready to have sort of a little grand opening. And it's in a great building. It's an old bank building, big nine-ton vault. People still make uh, arrangements like in restaurants, you know, let's say um, high-class restaurants where you can have a fashion line come in and through the restaurant because, you know, there's good, well-heeled customers there. Do they still do that or what? I've, I still, I've seen some when, when they have for like, I um, can't remember which fashion show I recently saw, which designer, but yes. I've seen it recently, and I had thought about something like that. Or I also like how I've seen some fashion shows in the concept of an airport, because I know I like to people watch. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's, I guess you could really use it anywhere. I want to thank you very much for being on the show. Um, before you leave, let me just say that we have one of your other key people, Abra Stevens, uh, on the show. We're going to bring her on right now. It is my distinct privilege to introduce Abra Stevens. Your name actually is Delilah Abra Stevens, but you're a best-selling author too, aren't you? I am, I am. So I show our audience, by the way, your book. This is Out Here in the Darkness. It's based on a real-life criminal case, is that correct? It is. Is it a case that was solved? Yes, uh, it took place in 1985 in Houston, Texas. Good. Um, what is your role here at Mueller Law? What do you do? I am the uh, director of legal operations as well as Mark's litigation paralegal. Okay, what does that involve? Really overseeing um, when, when a case comes into the office, preparing it for trial, making sure that by the time it gets to trial, everything is taken care of that Mark needs um, to present his case to the jury. So do you get phone calls in the middle of the night sometimes? Sometimes. Never know, right? Yeah, never know. <laughs> they need it. So you have been with Mark for a while. Um, what do you like best about what she does for the firm? Here's what I like about her. She is total support. I mean, she gets it. That's what I can say. You know, you, you, she just gets it. Yeah. And, and, and in some ways, I don't think you can train someone to be able to put up with someone like me or to, to help me. Seriously, I, I can be very difficult, um, but it's because I'm a perfectionist and I, I want so deeply to be really doing the right thing all the time. And, and so I set impossible standards for myself and it makes me impatient and frustrated. And, and, and she is the best that I've seen in the litigation format of being able to just go, I got this, and really does. That means I'm not gonna have to tomorrow morning go and redo something that should have been done right the first time. And that is a gem. Yeah, you have to make decisions fast, right? So you're yes. not wasting your time and what's the best way to do things, right? Absolutely. That's good. What's your background before you came here? Um, I uh, spent almost two decades as a paralegal um, and prior to coming here, I was a paralegal supervisor, so um, 54 paralegals in 31 states. I 
supported them and, and supervised. And What have you found unusual and interesting, and why do you like working here at Mueller Law? Creativity is um, praised. Uh, thinking outside of the box. Um, I guess the, uh, the confidence and the respect that Mark gives each of us to do our jobs and um, allow us to figure things out the way that work best for us is, uh, it's very unusual, um, especially in the legal world, um, to not be micromanaged, to um, not be told what your place is. Um, and, and I think that that's probably the most unique thing about this firm. Yeah, people like to be recognized, you know that. And if you give them the opportunity to do the best that they possibly can, and a lot of people want to, you know, you encourage that, you're going to get surprising good results, right? Yeah, it's about right alignment. You know, the right alignment magnifies your power so much. And, and this is, the, the, the people you've interviewed so far have all been on that track with me. Um, they make me feel better, smoother, more, um, I, I don't worry so much about everything. Um, and I should say that again, I do worry always, but, <laughs> but the, the, I feel like I have support and that when I feel like I have support, I didn't used to think I need support. I thought I could do it all myself and I've proven that wrong a thousand times. Now I just rather have a good team. Uh, that gets me and that I get and that listens and that I can listen to and respect. And I'm happy that if someone can do everything to a very high level, go for it. Right. Thank you so much. Glad you, glad you can. And a writer, having somebody who can actually understand the English language. That's quite an experience writing the book, right? Oh. How long did it take you? You said 11,000 hours. 11,000 hours of research and about 18 months to actually write it, uh, the after. You interview. actually went out and interviewed a lot of people. Right? I did. And you did that on your own dime. Yes. What motivated you to do that? Um, well, my um, closest family member, my cousin, was on his deathbed and my entire life, my, ent my family wanted me to write. And I kept saying, I'll get around to it. And the last time I saw my cousin, he said, I want you to make me one promise. Write a book. And, um, you know, I knew about this case from high school and uh, the case and my legal background, it just seemed to work and allowed me to fulfill the promise to my cousin and write the book. You know, your family wanted to be a writer. You could have written a fictional book, but you stuck to nonfiction. It's a tough road to haul, you know, because you have to, you have to be accurate. What motivated you to write this story? The way that it was portrayed in the media uh, very sensationalized and I knew there was something more something deeper and I felt that at this point in time the truth is the most important yeah and I want to thank you for being on the show it is my great pleasure to introduce Terry Thorne to the show welcome to the show Terry thank you Tell our audience a little bit about what you do here at Mueller Law. Well, over the years at Mueller Law, I've probably done a little of everything. Um, everything from intake specialist to trial support specialist. Mm -hmm. Done everything in between, except for obviously being an attorney, but I've handled pretty much most positions, primarily doing a trial support legal investigation. When a case comes in, before he decides to take the case on, you get involved with it, right? Um, I think I'm one of the most fortunate ones in, in the office that I see cases generally from the very beginning to the very end, so yes. So even before their cases, you investigate them to see whether they're viable? In, in most situations, yes. Do you ever come across a case where you say, you know, boss, we ain't going to make much money with this, but this is something we really need. Well, I think, I think I, <laughs> he, 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 he more tells us what we want to do. I, I think okay. it is fortunate, though, that um, you know, I've had the opportunity to, to have that guidance up front but also have the, uh, the the leeway to kind of do a few things that I want to do on my own. Sometimes I get a little trouble for going down a rabbit hole too far, but uh, I do. Yeah, seeing the eyes of how the justice system works through Mark, what kind of comments do you have on the justice system? On the justice system itself? 
Um, I, I, we we all should be thankful that we have it because we without a, a something to keep the order, but also to keep um, others in line. I think is very important. The, the way we handle cases, I think uh, we push the envelope on the justice part of it because we care about what we do. Doesn't matter if they're. Um, children in the early years or many of the other projects that we have going on, we've been able to adapt to those. But in that adaptation and that flexibility that we do, it, it causes us to take the things that we've learned in earlier forms of litigation and move them forward into things that um, actually become more helpful. So in the long run, the, re the, the reward we get from the justice systems allows us to help others, but it also helps us because we push forward to uh, to the to the to the end. Being on the inside of all these cases and seeing how Mueller law works, how do you find them different and let's say advantageous to a potential client than other law firms? Uh, don't know how to do that. Do that in a short way. Other than I've I've worked for a lot of attorneys. I've worked for Mark for uh, with Mark for about twenty seven years, and I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, but I've also seen the best. Um, I've worked with a lot of attorneys that. Um, try to approach things in a very cookie cutter way. We don't do that here. We take the opportunity to help people, but we also take the opportunity to think, and I hate to use a, a, a cliche of a thinking out of the box, but we do. Um, Mark thinks big, but he also tells us to always think bigger. And what that does for us as a team allows us to push the envelope of litigation. We have guidelines we have to follow. We do, those, do that very well. But what we have been able to do is take our best and bring it into a situation where others uh, from other law firms, and like I said, I work for, uh, for others uh, on a contract basis. Um, we take what we do very, very seriously. And we don't look at those things as a run-of-the-mill type things. We look at it as how can we give our best so that others can be helped for it, and it's it's a different environment here. It's kind of I think we he's saying is, and 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 Delilah said the same thing is we don't know the word impossible. If it's right, if we believe it's right, then yes, we can. And um, and I think that's what we mean. Sure. Big enough is that there. I've got to believe that the law is something that has to adapt. And it has to adjust to what's right, and we need that because the court systems, you know, otherwise aren't going to work. The political systems haven't worked. We have to. When we give that up, we're not, we're we're no good. I want to thank you very much for being on the show and all your contributions here, because obviously what you do makes this work. We make it work. Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to introduce Ariel Schaefer to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Tell our audience a little bit about what you do here at this firm. So right now I'm kind of helping with anybody who is onboarded for the current um, contamination case that we're working on. Um, I'm helping with all of the intake, um, contacting people, making sure the mail outs go out correctly, uh, coordinating with the other law firm that we're working with, and just kind of generally wearing a lot of different hats for this. How do you like it? Pretty diverse, huh? I love it a lot. I never thought that I would be in an office like this, but I love all my coworkers, and it's been great. Well, I have to say, it is an unusual office. <laughs> There's only one other office that I've seen that has the same artifacts on the wall and kind of the diverse background, and that's Jerry Spence's, you know, uh, when he was practicing law. Yeah. And I think that makes for a more rounded individual, you know, when you can bring into the courtroom your experience when you can bring in all of your diverse activities and that sort of thing, because then you start talking the same talk that the jury wants to hear. You know, they want to hear from real people. Don't you agree? I do agree, yes. And it's, it's nice to have such a diverse group of people all working together towards this common goal. Yeah. How did you run into Mark? How did you find uh, him? I actually, I've uh, known Mark from the Halcyon days, so way, yeah. way back when. Halcyon's a coffee shop. Coffee shop right down the street. and. Uh, we both were regulars, and so I'd see him every once in a while, and then here we are like five years later. Well, she pitched in on our party that you know about that was a big event that we had some, some, some data issues with, and she and, and Mari, who you've met too, pitched, absolutely 
pitched in in an emergency situation and worked day and night. It was yeah, crazy. And, it was and, and, and then managed to look good and have fun at the party on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and after they did all that work, and it was just like, well, went, well you know what? Why should this stop here? You guys are really yeah. good. Why can't we just make this keep working? And we have. And it's been one of those things where I'm like, this is really, this is what people should be working with. So mm -hmm. it's, it's so good. And it feels so good. And she likes it, and we like her. Yeah. One, one of the things I've noticed from everybody here is that today's Sunday. You're here doing these shows, which is great. But you're all loving working here. That's what I've noticed from yes. everybody. I, I'll come in day or night. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm very glad to help. It is my great pleasure to introduce Max and Andy Mueller to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Tell our audience now a little bit about how your band came about. You've been musicians for, what, about 10, 15 years maybe? Or Professionally, about 10 years. Yeah. We've been musicians our whole life. And your genre of music is? Rock metal. So basically, we took influence from all the classics, what you consider now as you know, dad rock, Led Zeppelin, Metallica, ACDC. Guns N' Roses, Sublime, all that kind of stuff. And we just take bits and pieces of our favorite stuff and create our own sound to the best of our ability. I'd say we try to capture the essence of classic rock and heavy metal with a heavy emphasis on groove and melody. And in almost every song, we have guitar solos. And you both play the guitar. We both play guitar, we both sing, we write all our own music. How so big is your band other than you two? It's just us two, and we actually hire our rhythm section to learn the parts. So basically, we try and make every song really hard hitting. So even if it's like a catchy kind of pop song, we have like really intense drums and guitar riffs with catchy vocal hooks on top. So you have rock fans that like it and then people that are more into like something you could dance to and pop and lighter stuff, they can get into it as well. And you play, we're here in Austin, you play in clubs around town? Yeah. What clubs do you play in? Oh man, we played all over 6th Street. Uh, so too many to name, but tons of them. Are they mainly like dance clubs or what? We, uh, we play rock venues here. Uh, we've toured the United States. We've played in Brazil. So I understand you're going out on another tour soon. Yes, we plan on touring. To place. L.A., right? Yeah. Where are you going to go be in L.A.? Uh, we're going to play the Viper Room. So um, do you guys have a website? We do. Twinsages.com. Twinsages.com. Twin, Twin, Twin Sages. And on that website, what will people find? Find some pictures, a little bio clips to our two YouTube videos and some new songs that we're going to put out very soon. That's terrific. And this is all part of your dad's kind of uh, business, isn't it? Oh, yeah. He's essentially our record label and our management company. And the management company is what? Voodoo Cowboy, yes. As twins, are you best friends? Yes and no. Uh, being a twin, I'll explain, is really cool. It's, it's bad in the way that you always get compared, no matter what. No matter what you do in life, you'll always be compared. It's he, he's funnier, he's better looking, or he's better at guitar, or whatever. But at the same time, you always... Are you? Of course. <laughs> way better. No. <laughs> I think it's a positive thing. I think it's like we, we lift each other up and push each other. You always have a teammate. You have like a really awesome teammate to practice sports, music, creative outlets, whatever, and like a driving competitive force to always help each other improve. Yeah, have, you said you've been singing professionally for 10 years. Yes. Did you, was this what you always wanted to do from the get-go? Initially, it was just guitar, but then we couldn't find anyone that sounded halfway decent to sing. Yeah. So we just learned by necessity how to do it, and then everything else too. We wanted to empower ourselves. We thought it would be so difficult it's got to be really hard for people who just do one thing. Like if you're just a guitar player, then you have to find bandmates. And so we we're like, we should learn how to write songs and play and right. power ourselves. And, you know, it got better and better over the years. We had to put a lot of time and effort into it. And now I feel like it's at a point where it's something we're proud of. And you know, today, more than ever, you have a lot of these shows where they take people who have, you know, maybe you're very good musicians, actors, whatever, and put them on like The Boys, American Idol, yeah. uh, America's Got Talent. Have you tried out for any of these shows? Oh, no. I've never you would seen. not? I'm not saying I would not, but we have not. Do you think that would help, though? I mean, put you in the national scene? Potentially. Yeah. Sure. But don't they want to, I think they require you to sign some sort of contract so if you get successful, they make money. Probably. They probably own, like, everything about you after that. How did you get your uh, future gig, like, in, the, in, in Los Angeles? We have a booking agent. Oh, do you? Yeah. So he's super awesome guy. He's going to set us up. 
all the major cities and you know tons of places along the way. Do you get paid to do this? Do we get paid? Yeah. Yes, but as a band, there are expenses. You know, yeah. travel expenses, merchandise, lodging, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So everything costs money, but you do make money in the end. Yeah. Well, we hope you keep us posted, and uh, I certainly wish you the most success. You know, love to see you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.